If you grew up watching the Matilda movie, the one based on the book by Roald Dahl, not the one about a boxing kangaroo, then this episode might just ruin your childhood. Or it'll give you a newfound appreciation for the movie that allows you to watch it in a new wholesome light that you never would have anticipated. I know those are opposite ends of the reception spectrum, but Matilda has a complicated origin story. From Roald Dahl's original draft being a train wreck of a story where Matilda gets involved in a straight up illegal gambling scheme to the very real hardships that Mara Wilson had to endure in her family life while filming the movie adaptation from 1996 to the much more recent censorship scandal that hit newsstands in early 2023, where the language police attempted to update Dahl's writings for modern sensibilities. In this episode, I'll be breaking down the complete messed up origins of Matilda. And by the end, you will never see the story the same way. Be sure to sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons if you're happy about another deep dive into a Roald Dahl classic, and let's begin. Now, because the creators of Matilda were so loyal to the book, I'm talking nearly shot for shot, there aren't a lot of differences for me to point out early on. But as the story progresses and as we approach the finale, you'll see them slowly start to stack up. The book opens very similar to the movie, with an unnamed narrator going on a short tangent about children. Only in the book, he's ranting about how difficult and frustrating kids can be, while the movie's narrator puts emphasis on the unique destinies that await each and every child who's born. Basically the opposite of Tyler Durden's mantra. I've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'd all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars, but we won't. Additionally, the book's narrator clearly states the story is set in England, while in the movie, it's America. Next, we meet Matilda, the star of the story, and for some reason, the bane of her family's existence. Her mother, father, and older brother all despised Matilda from the moment she spoke her first words which was much sooner than your average baby. No matter how capable little Matilda proved herself to be, from learning to speak fluently at age one and a half to reading full newspapers at age three, her family never appreciated her gifts and paid her no mind. Fortunately, she accepted this reality early on and learned to take care of herself. Both the book and the movie show Matilda developing a fast friendship with the local librarian, Mrs. Phelps, who teaches Matilda how to borrow books and encourages her love of learning, a quality that Matilda's family is strongly opposed to. But that isn't surprising after learning who her family is. Matilda's father is your prototypical shysty car salesman who upcharges his customers for vehicles he's illegally tampered with so they they seem newer than they are. Employing tactics like using a power drill to turn back the mileage counter or reattaching an old bumper with super glue. Daddy, you're a crook. In the movie, we see cops passively investigating Mr. Wormwood because of these shenanigans, but there is no police presence in the book. They are not cops, they are ace powerboat salesmen. Matilda's mom is just as cruel as her dad, and judging by how Dahl describes her, she's a poorly held together mess. She wore heavy makeup, and she had one of those unfortunate bulging figures where the flesh appears to be strapped in all around the body to prevent it from falling out. In the film, her parents don't physically resemble how they look in the book at all, but they behave exactly the same. As a result, both versions of Matilda decide they're going to punish their parents for their beastly ways. Matilda soon learns that vengeance is sweet by mixing peroxide into her father's hair tonic so it bleaches his hair platinum blonde. A bold new look for him, but she wanted to take it a step further. She takes some super glue that's lying around and coats the inside of his hat with it so it sticks to his head. When he realizes it's stuck and that it's not just going to come off through brute force, Mrs. Wormwood is forced to chop it off bit by bit, including the pieces of hair that it was attached to, leaving Mr. Wormwood looking like a reverse Friar Tuck. So far, all the pranks I've described appear in both the book and the movie, but there is one prank that's exclusive to the book, when she convinces her family their house is haunted. To be fair though, I can see why they left it out because it's pretty ridiculous. Basically, Matilda borrows her friend's talking bird, which can only say two phrases, hello, 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 and rattle my bones. I'm sure you can see where this is going. She shoves the birdcage up her chimney, and when her family hears it, they think the house is haunted and run away in fear. It's a funny bit, and Danny DeVito would have absolutely killed it. A ghost! No! Ghost! No! Ghost! No, no, ghost! No, no, ghost! Please. Get out! No. Get out! 
Now it's at this point in the movie, around the 21 minute mark, where we get the first hint that there's more to Matilda than meets the eye when her dad physically restrains her so she has to watch TV, and she gets so angry that she blows the TV up with her mind. I wanna learn how to blow shit up with my mind. This does not happen at all in the book, and she doesn't use her powers for the first time until chapter 14, about two thirds of the way through. Besides that small idiosyncrasy, the stories plow on at the same pace. Matilda's parents send her to school, and we soon meet one of the most iconic characters in all of children's literature, the Trunch Bowl. But first, I am in desperate need of some hydration, so I want to thank our sponsor, Liquid IV. You may have missed it, but Liquid IV has given their packaging a little refresh. Yes, they paid me to make that pun. It's still the same hydrating formula we all know and love, the one I've been relying on for years, but it represents what the product does so much better. You can see it right here, faster hydration than water alone. And the imagery of the fresh fruit on the side looks as delicious as it tastes. But as great as the vibrant colors and updated logo are, they would mean nothing without Liquid IV's scientific formula. Liquid IV actually hydrates you faster and more efficiently than water by increasing how much water you absorb and retain and by better distributing it through your body. A single packet turns your simple water into a mythical hydration elixir, blessing it with three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drink, eight vitamins and nutrients, no artificial sweeteners or colors, and it's vegan and gluten-free. And somehow it delivers all of these benefits while tasting delicious. Regardless of what your plans are this summer, relaxing on the beach, jamming out at some festivals, or seeing the world on a road trip, hydration should be your top priority. Try out the refreshed liquid IV by hitting the link in the description. New customers can use Use my discount code John Solo for 20% off your order. To fully comprehend the villainous vibes that Agatha Trunchbull gave off and what it was like to stand in her presence, we need to take a look at the way that Dahl himself described her. And fans of the movie will appreciate this because Pam Ferris portrays her perfectly. She was a gigantic holy terror, a fierce tyrannical monster who frightened the life out of the pupils and teachers alike. There was an aura of menace about her even at a distance, and when she came up close, you could almost feel the dangerous heat radiating from her as from a red hot rod of metal. When she marched, Miss Trunchbull never walked, she always marched like a stormtrooper with long strides and arms a swinging. When she marched along a corridor, you could actually hear her snorting as she went. And if a group of children happened to be in her path, she plowed right on through them like a tank, with small people bouncing off her to left and right. Fistering ball of ass! Very rarely does a character get translated so accurately from page to screen, where they nail everything from appearance to persona. But what's interesting about the Trunchbull character is that each of these elements was inspired by different women from Roald Dahl's life. According to Jeremy Traglown's biography on Roald Dahl, a fantastic resource if you want to learn everything there is to know about Dahl's life, and one of my primary resources for this episode, her looks were based on the principle of Water Perry Gardening School, where Dahl and his sisters bought plants. Her name was Miss Beatrix Havergal, and she was a lovely woman. For real though, Dahl was friendly with her, and he did not incorporate her personality into Trunchbull at all. However, Miss Havergal had a distinct and singular look. Every day she wore a dark green blazer with brass buttons, green pants, green woolen stockings, a brown tie, and brown felt hat. In fact, Dahl actually borrowed a picture of her from a colleague who knew her to give to his illustrator, Quentin Blake, so he could draw her exactly right. And according to that colleague, Blake nailed it, besides the tongues on her shoes being too big. But funnily enough, almost every illustration in my copy of Matilda crops out her feet, so I wonder if that's why. Unfortunately, Miss Havergal passed away long before the book was ever published, so she never got to see her illustrated doppelganger, but her iconic drip will live on forever in the pages of Dahl's masterpiece, on the big screen, and on the shelves of select Spirit Halloweens. As for the woman who inspired Trunchbull's icy cold, yet somehow burning hot temperament, <coughs> she will not be remembered so fondly. I would compare Trunchbull's progenitor, Miss Pratchett, to a black hole. She was a crotchety old coot who sucked the joy out of any room she entered. But for some reason, she owned a candy shop 
and Dahl and his friends always went there after being released from Landaff Cathedral School. I should clarify that everything that we know about Miss Pratchett comes from a very biased Roald Dahl who went through a traumatic childhood experience with her. So it's totally possible her friends and family found her to be a delightful woman. We're gonna proceed under the assumption that his descriptions are true to life, but I felt that disclaimer had to be made considering I'm speaking very ill of a defenseless dead woman right now. In Dahl's autobiography, Boy, he tells a story that he refers to as the Great Mouse Plot. <laughs> The way Dahl tells this story, you get the vibe that it's simultaneously one of his proudest moments and most painful memories. And the fact that he chose an illustration of it as the book's cover shows you how much of an impact the experience had on him. One day, when Dahl was eight years old, he and his friend found a dead rat underneath the floorboards in their classroom, and he had the bright idea to sneak it into Miss Pratchett's jar of gobstoppers. And no, that is not a euphemism. They executed their plan that afternoon, and it went off without a hitch. Dahl's friend Thwaite distracted Pratchett while Dahl put the rat in the candy jar, and they slithered out like the little snakes they were. Dahl was on cloud nine as the sheer epicness of this prank really sank in, but when he walked by the store the next morning, his stomach dropped. The store was still closed, Miss Pratchett wasn't in her usual spot behind the counter, and the jar of gobstoppers was lying smashed on the floor. Afraid that Pratchett may have had a heart attack and died, little Roald Dahl was scared for his own life when he got to school, and the principal, Mr. Coombs, started the day off by calling an assembly where the police were present. But at the same moment he accepted that his life was going to end in the world's tiniest electric chair, Miss Pratchett made her grand entrance, and she began inspecting every student at the assembly. It didn't take her long to point out Dahl and his four friends, and it probably won't take you long to guess what their punishment would be. Mr. Coombs would use a cane to beat the backsides of every one of the boys involved until they were raw, all while Miss Pratchett cheered him on from the corner, smiling bigger than Dahl had ever seen her. The parallels with Trunchbull are obvious here. Use the rod, beat the child, that's my motto. This woman is taking pleasure in children's pain. Hell, I'm sure Miss Pratchett had her own version of the chokey in the back of her store. Now don't get me wrong, Pratchett was absolutely entitled to be furious about Dahl's disgusting prank, but everyone knows that at least 50% of decisions that kids make are stupid. And it's not always their fault. They're still figuring things out. So if you can't handle that, then maybe don't own a candy shop. And definitely don't work at a school. My idea of a perfect school is one in which there are no children at all. But if you're new to the Matilda verse and not impressed with Trunchbull as a villain yet, you're about to see why she's the Emperor Palpatine of children's literature. This happens a little later on in the book, but mere minutes after making her grand entrance in the movie, she grabs a little girl by her pigtails, spins her around, and launches her through the air, and the girl crash lands 100 meters away. This isn't even the first kid we see her throw. Moments before this, in a flashback, she tosses some poor lad out the classroom window. In the book, Trunchbull's athleticism and freakish strength earned her accolades as a hammer thrower in the Olympics but the movie also adds javelin and shot put to her retinue and makes great use out of them. Shot put, javelin, hammer throw. Like that scene toward the end where we see her menacingly sharpening her javelin by the fireplace. I just love that this woman is such a psycho that this is the only thing she's planned for her evening. On the very opposite end of the spectrum is Miss Honey, who, as far as I know, isn't based on any living person, but to me, seems like an amalgam of all the traits Roald Dahl thought teachers should have. Or really, anyone who works with children. She's kind, empathetic, speaks at a level they can understand, but doesn't talk down to them. She truly wants what's best for them, and even sacrifices her own well-being to make sure they get it. Miss Honey is Matilda's teacher, and quickly becomes her mentor advocating for Matilda to both Trunchbull and her parents, suggesting she be moved up a grade and given special treatment. But these ignoramuses shut her down every time. She can multiply large sums in her head. So can a calculator. 
The next five chapters of the book match the movie almost exactly, so I won't bother going into extraneous detail. In both versions, Trunchbull attempts to torture a boy named Bruce Bogtrotter for eating her personal cake by forcing him to eat an entire additional cake in front of the whole school. But much to her frustration, he receives some encouragement from his fellow classmates and succeeds with flying colors, so she releases her anger by smashing a plate on his head. Then Lavender, Matilda's closest friend, at school finds a newt outside and slips it into Trunchbull's jug of water while she substitute teaching their class. I wonder if this was also inspired by Doll's childhood scheme with the rat. While that newt is just chilling in the jug, Trunchbull walks around the room roasting the students and Miss Honey like she's Tony Hinchcliffe. She calls them witless weeds, empty-headed hamsters, and stupid globs of glue. Then she says that she hates small people and that she never was small a line that's also featured in the movie. They're all mistakes, children. Filthy, nasty things. Glad I never was one. And coincidentally appears in Tim Burton's adaptation of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You're all quite short, aren't you? Well, yeah, we're children. Well, that's no excuse. I was never as short as you. Trunchbull also physically abuses these kids. She picks up one by his hair until clumps come out. Then she grabs another by his ears and holds him in the air while they stretch. It's a pretty uncomfortable scene to read through, honestly. But the whole tone of this visit changes when Trunchbull refills her glass of water. As the Trunchbull pours water from her jug, feeling like she's in complete control of her life, the nasty, slippery newt slides out and splashes into her glass, and she freaks out. Interestingly, in the movie, Trunchbull takes a big ol' swig from the glass before noticing the newt but in the book, she spots it right away. In both versions, she accuses Matilda of putting the newt in her jug, and in both versions, Matilda denies it. But while she's getting flipped out at, her brain goes into overdrive, and suddenly the glass of water and newt splash onto the trunch bowl. Now, the movie Matilda never goes into detail about what her powers are and how it feels to use them, but in the book, Dahl describes it vividly, saying her eyes get hot, a pressure builds up, and it feels like electricity is shooting directly out of them, sending millions of tiny, invisible arms to manipulate what she wants. The illustration you're looking at now is not from the book, by the way. Sir Quentin Blake kept his illustrations very minimal, so I recruited character artist Willy Tron to give us his rendition of what it may have looked like. Link to his socials are in the description. I think the movie demonstrated Matilda's powers pretty well without using crazy special effects. Fun fact, actually, before they filmed this scene of Matilda dancing, the actress who played her, Mara Wilson, went up to Danny DeVito and told him that she was embarrassed to dance in front of the whole crew. So, to make her more comfortable, he turned up the music and made the whole crew dance along with her which I think is adorable. You've just got to appreciate the grown-ups in the movie business who respect kids and go out of their way to make sure they feel safe and cared for, because it's depressingly rare. Nah, you eat it. Hmm? I also find it funny, in an ironic way, how the guy playing the abusive father character took the most care of her while she was on set, because it didn't stop with moments like this. Not many people know this, but while Mara Wilson was filming Matilda, her mother was undergoing chemo treatments for breast cancer. So to make things easier on her and her family, Danny and his wife Rita, who plays Matilda's mother, let her stay at their house after filming days. I'm sure this went a long way in helping the young Mara balance these two challenging chapters of her life that just so happened to overlap. Sadly, Mara's mother passed away before the movie released in theaters, but she was shown an early edit of the movie, so she got to see her daughter's amazing performance before she died. And now, it's my job to dig us out of this depressing hole without seeming insensitive. Back to the story, after Trunchbull has the newt thrown on her, she freaks out, storms out, and then Miss Honey dismisses the kids for recess. But Matilda stays behind and confesses to Miss Honey that she used her powers to move the glass. Of course, Miss Honey doesn't believe her at first, but Matilda easily proves herself by using her mind to lift up a glass of water. At least, that's what happens in the book. An interesting and subtle difference with the movie is that when movie Matilda first tries to show Miss Honey her powers, she fails and has to do some practicing at home before she can use them reliably. Despite this difference, both scenes end with Miss Honey inviting Matilda to her cottage. 
and my god does it get sad. Miss Honey's backstory is rough. Her mother passed away when she was only two, her aunt became her live-in caretaker, then her father Magnus died a few years later under mysterious circumstances. This allowed the aunt to seize complete control of his entire fortune and estate and become the sole guardian of Miss Honey dominating every aspect of her life until Honey was bold enough to move out on her own. Sadly, the aunt still controlled Honey's finances though, so she was only given a small fraction of her paycheck from the school, and the only thing she could afford was this rundown garden shack for 10 pence a week. There was no bed, no heat, no running water, and no electricity. She was a street rat, and if Aladdin saw where she lived, he would have taken that bread away from those little kids and given it to her. But there is still a shoe that hasn't dropped yet. That horrible aunt was Miss Trunchbull. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 God, please, no, 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 which you already knew if you saw the movie. Another interesting reversal here is that when Miss Honey tells her story in the book, she keeps Trunchbull's identity a secret, while in the movie, she presents it as Trunchbull's backstory, and we don't learn the abused girl was Miss Honey until we get to her cottage. I'm not sure why they changed it. Maybe they thought it'd be too hard to keep the aunt's identity a secret if she showed up on on screen since Trunchbull has such a distinct shape, but I thought it was an interesting difference regardless. Oh, and I think at this point the movie needed some action and drama, so they added a chase scene through Trunchbull's house that's scarier than anything I've seen since Predator. You ghost us, motherfucker. You give up position one more time, I'll bleed you real quiet. I would honestly rather be chased by Jason Voorhees than Trunchbull. Tell Freddy Krueger to bring it on, because it's not his face I'm seeing in my nightmares. It's this one. Now hearing Miss Honey's story has a deep impact on Matilda, who decides that she must do something about it. She prods for a little more information, then she starts practicing her powers at home, just like in the movie. Only in the book, she's lighting a cigar instead of making a bowl of cereal. When the movie's Matilda feels capable with her powers, she bravely returns to Trunchbull's house to take back a doll that was special to Miss Honey when she was growing up, as well as harass Trunchbull so she thinks her house is haunted by the ghost of Magnus Honey, the man she allegedly killed and robbed. I should be clear that neither the book nor the movie outright confirms that Trunchbull caused his death, but both Honey and Matilda are convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt and act as if her guilt is confirmed, so we the readers just accept it. If she was falsely accused, that would make this epic finale a lot darker, but she's still a garbage person, so don't feel too bad. Now the book does not include this initial haunting scene. Instead, we skip to when school starts the next day but both version stories match up almost exactly from this point onward, with Trunchbull stepping in to teach Honey's class once again. The only major difference here is that the book's Trunchbull didn't go through a haunting the night before, so she isn't in the same crazed state as the film. Regardless, she proceeds to needlessly berate the kids as a way of punishing them for receiving the parental love she was evidently deprived of as a child, until Matilda steps in. While Trunchbull was holding a boy named Wilfred upside down by his foot, another student named Nigel started shouting for everyone's attention. A piece of chalk was floating in front of the blackboard and it was writing something. Agatha, this is Magnus. This is Magnus. It is Magnus, and you'd better believe it. Agatha, give my Jenny back her house. Give my Jenny her wages. Give my Jenny the house. Then get out of here. If you don't, I will come and get you. I will come and get you like you got me. I am watching, Agatha. Not the most coherent message, a little redundant for sure, but you get the gist. And most importantly, so does Trunchbull. The man that she allegedly murdered will take revenge against her unless she gives all the sweet loot she took off him to Miss Honey his rightful heir. The shock and utter disbelief that Trunchbull felt while watching this unfold was enough to overload her system, causing her to faint and hit the ground hard. After this, some teachers dragged out the unconscious body of the defeated, bloated beast, and Miss Honey thanked Matilda for her help with a hug 
and a kiss. The movie version unfolds pretty similar to this, only they make it a lot more climactic. Because at the end of that haunting scene, Trunchbull found a red ribbon and knew it belonged to Matilda. So she visited the class the next day, planning to scare her into confessing. But this doesn't go as planned. Miss Honey reveals to the class that Trunchbull is her aunt. Then, when Matilda is about to face Trunchbull's wrath, she starts impersonating Magnus's spirit and scares the ever-living hell out of her. Her ghostly message is mostly the same as the book, but concludes with Matilda smacking Trunchbull with erasers until she faints. A bit more drama is added when Trunchbull wakes up and proceeds to throw a student out the goddamn window again, but Matilda saves him with her powers, and soon enough, all the students turn on Trunchbull. Giving her the old Festival of Fools treatment and throwing everything but the kitchen sink at her as she runs for the exit. As both versions of Matilda watch her vanquished enemy flee, she feels elated, like she just saw the face of God. And from here on out, things just keep getting better. The Trunchbull fled town in the middle of the night, and Magnus's will magically showed up and Miss Honey was given the inheritance that she was owed all these years. But my favorite details are at the very end. So in both versions of the story, Matilda's dad is being investigated by the lawman for his shady business practices. In the movie, we see the cops snooping, sleeping, and sleuthing around her house, and at one point, Matilda's dad even confronts them. The cops, dad. You interested in timeshare? But ultimately, they get enough evidence to arrest him. And you know where you'll end up? in a federal orphanage. So the Wormwood family has to quickly pack their things and escape to Guam, which would technically still be in the US's jurisdiction, but it makes sense that the Wormwoods wouldn't know that. In the book, we aren't told anything about Mr. Wormwood being investigated until the very end, when Matilda returns home from spending a day with Miss Honey and finds her family frantically packing for Spain. In both versions, she doesn't want to go with them, so she requests their consent for Miss Honey to adopt her, which they readily agree to in a matter of seconds. However, the movie needed it to be a little more official, so Matilda whips out some adoption papers that she'd apparently been carrying around with her since she was old enough to Xerox, and her family quickly signs them leaving her and Miss Honey to live happily ever after. As for her powers, the movie says Matilda never had to use them again, but it looks like she still uses them for convenience, like to get a book off the shelf from across the room. The book goes down a little bit differently though. You see, after Matilda's school gets a new headmaster, she's moved to the top class, and soon after, she completely loses her powers. Miss Honey then shares her theory about what happened. Basically, Matilda developed her powers because her brain wasn't being challenged enough and had a ton of excess energy that she was able to channel through her eyes and manipulate her environment. With. When she was finally bumped up to a challenging class that required her to use all of her brain power, she didn't have any left to power her telekinesis. But that's okay. Matilda says that she didn't want to go through life as a miracle worker. Now, if only she knew the kinds of miracles that Roald Dahl had her perform in the first draft of the story. If you're a lifelong fan of the Matilda movie or book, then this section is going to be a doozy for you because we're about to review the original edition of the story. That is, the very first draft that Roald Dahl sent to his editor, Stephen Roxburgh. I'll be honest, the sequence of events that you're about to hear leaves me a little conflicted over how to feel about Roald Dahl as a person. It's a well-known fact that the man had plenty of controversial opinions that most people nowadays would consider deplorable, but here his thoughts manifest into actions. And let me just say, I would never want to work for him. The details of this story and the real life events surrounding it also come from Jeremy Treglown's biography on Dahl. So let's start at the beginning, because from the outset, this version of Matilda is wildly different, and dare I say, a little bit evil. You remember how, in the beginning of the story, Matilda is described as intellectually brilliant with an IQ that far exceeds her foolish, malevolent parents? Well, that all applies to the original. 
except her parents were the ideal, nurturing, loving couple that any child would be lucky to grow up with. Matilda didn't seem to appreciate this though, and instead of pulling pranks on them as a punishment for their wicked ways, she is the wicked one, and she just did it for the sick thrill of making their lives miserable. Another discrepancy that changes the entire meaning of the story is the role of Trunchbull, who played no part in the original conflict. In fact, instead of the grand climax revolving around the differences between she and Honey's educational methods and the crimes that she committed against her own family, she kind of just disappeared halfway through the story. So what was the original conflict about? Well, you're not gonna believe this or you might simply not want to. A little over halfway through the story, when Miss Honey, who in this version was called Miss Hayes, learned of Matilda's genius and telekinetic powers, she would make a confession of her own. And I wish I was making this up. Miss Hayes confessed to Matilda that she had a fever, and the only prescription was more cowbell. Okay, I am making that up. Miss Hayes revealed to Matilda that her father was a bookie and that she had a gambling addiction. Specifically, she bet on the ponies, and somehow she was in debt 20,000 pounds. Matilda, who at this point had evidently shed her wicked skin and become the curious, helpful, resourceful girl that we all know from the final version of the story, decided to help Miss Hayes, and together they concocted a scheme to get her out of debt. Kind of like the final publication, Matilda begins to practice using her powers by going over to the local farm and pushing over all the cows and ponies, which I'm sure the farmer truly appreciated. At the same time, Miss Hayes sells her mother's old ring for 2,000 pounds so they have some funds to bet with. When their preparation is complete, these two soon-to-be criminals go to Newmarket and put all of their money on a horse with 50 to 1 odds. And she and Miss Hayes pocket 100,000 pounds, about 269,000 pounds in the modern day, and almost 350,000 in freedom bucks. With more than enough cash to get herself out of debt and live comfortably, Hayes renounces gambling forever and everyone lives happily ever after. As you can see, this is supremely different than what we got. By the story's finale, Matilda's malevolence is completely forgotten about and so is Trunchbull. Not only that, because the story's main conflict left Trunchbull out completely, there was no need for Miss Hayes' temperament to contrast with hers effectively making her a completely different character and not nearly as sweet as the honey that she would later take her name from. Call me crazy, but I just have this feeling that a story about a six-year-old helping her teacher recover from a gambling addiction wouldn't have resonated nearly as much as the version we got. Though I would love to hear your thoughts on that, especially if you grew up with the book or movie, so comment them down below. But now you may be wondering how this mess of an original became the story that we all know and love today. And while Dahl obviously deserves most of the credit, we have to shine some light on the role that his editor, Steven Roxburg, played. Long story short, when Dahl sent the first draft you just heard to Roxburg, who worked for his publishers at Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, the editor saw an incredible amount of potential but he expressed some concern over the issues I highlighted in my breakdown. The bizarre conflict, the complete disconnection between the first and second halves, along with some structural and timing issues. He sent his notes to Dahl, who somewhat reluctantly incorporated the changes into his second draft. And while it still wasn't perfect, Roxburgh was never able to communicate his few remaining issues to Dahl. That's because Dahl, who was approaching the end of his life, was looking to maximize the profit from one of the last books he would ever write, and he knew he did not have a contract signed with Roxburgh or FSG. He demanded to be paid a full 15% royalty over what was paid to his illustrator, Quentin Blake. And while Roxburgh had basically no choice but to agree to this, he made it clear that he wouldn't be able to offer such lucrative terms on future deals, which infuriated Dahl. Not only that, when he sent the second draft of the story to his American editors, they loved it and planned to announce its release for the spring of 1988. So with that seed planted in his mind, he went looking for some UK publishers who would print the story as is. Even though Dahl had been working with Roxburg for years at this point and privately expressed his sadness about ending their partnership to his family, they ultimately convinced him to not let sentimentality get in the way of business. In other words, why let someone's poor widow Fifi stop you from turning a profit? Dahl went on to release Matilda during his desired time frame with his new publisher, Penguin Random House, 
and while he was very open about the original story being far different than the final draft, he never publicly acknowledged the invaluable role that Steven Roxburgh played in getting it to that point, which in my opinion is pretty messed up, especially when you consider this was Dahl's fastest selling book ever, with over half a million paperbacks being sold in the first six months. And that was just in Britain. As much respect as I have for Dahl's work and his creative mind, I cannot imagine withholding credit from the person who essentially saved my book from being a total flop. Then again, Dahl seems like the type to deny that his is even capable of stinking, so I doubt he saw it that way. But as flawed of a man as he was, the story that we got in the end is the one that he wanted to tell which is why it makes me sick to think that his publishers would make such dramatic changes to it after his death. Yup, it's that time of year again, when we take a look at all the ways that an iconic story treasured by millions of children and adults from countries and cultures all around the world was vandalized by the over-enthusiastic sensitivity readers at the Inclusive Minds organization. For those new to this situation, I'll give you a quick breakdown of the timeline, but if you wanna read about it yourself, there are links to every article I used as a resource at the bottom of the description. So back in 2020, the Roald Dahl estate came under fire when some old anti-Semitic quotes from the author resurfaced. These quotes had been in the public eye before. In fact, many of them were published for the public by Dahl himself, but in 2020, the social climate it demanded a blind adherence to tolerance and inclusion. So whenever a public figure failed to follow this message, they were lambasted, even if they'd been dead for decades. I'm not gonna go into the specifics of what Dahl said because YouTube would hit this episode with a community strike for including hate speech and then no one would see it, but there's no denying that his statements were bigoted and ill-informed. So Dahl's family, who still controlled his estate, posted an apology on their website. The problem with apologizing even when it's done well and for the right reasons, is that the party being apologized to may not be satisfied. And after witnessing you bend the knee to their demands, they want to take it a step further and shove your face in the dirt. I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye. I believe what happened is that the Dahl estate sought to proactively avoid getting dirt in their eyes and overcorrected in their attempt to make up for the author's hurtful statements. Possibly after being encouraged by their publisher, Puffin Books, who makes millions of pounds a year from Dahl's books alone and no doubt wanted to protect their cash cow. Together, the Roald Dahl Story Company and Puffin Books reached out to an organization called Inclusive Minds, which seeks to increase the diversity and representation in children's books so that they're accessible to every child. And I think most of us would agree, that's a pretty noble goal. Personally, I've never found a book less enjoyable because the characters didn't look like me or have my specific ailments, but I don't doubt that it can be helpful for children who are struggling to accept certain qualities about themselves to read about a character who not only shares those same qualities, but embraces them and succeeds in the face of them. So if Inclusive Minds wanted to help the authors of Tomorrow write new inclusive stories, then more power to them. The problem here was they made hundreds of changes to books that had been in the public eye for decades and that were written by a man who very publicly stated he never wanted his books edited after his death. He's quoted saying, I've warned my publishers that if they later on so much as change a single comma in one of my books, they will never see another word from me. I just hope to God that will never happen to any of my writings as I am lying comfortably in my Viking grave. Despite the author's clear-cut thoughts on this, Puffin Books, the Roald Dahl Story Company, and Inclusive Minds spent the better part of three years, and who knows how much money, editing Dahl's works for modern audiences. Interestingly though, in 2021, Dahl's family sold the rights to his stories to Netflix for a reported $686 million after this process had already been started. So when the UK-based Puffin Books announced the changes in early 2023, Dahl's long-time, lifelong fans raged at them and Netflix, who was like, hey, we just got here. Go yell at the Puffins if you got a problem. Now at this point, you've got to be wondering exactly what changes did they make? What parts of Matilda were so controversial that they had to be replaced or removed entirely? Lucky for us, there were four journalists from The Telegraph who went through every single doll book and took notes on every change they found. 
Their names are Ed Cumming, Abigail Buchanan, Genevieve Hole Allen, and Benedict Smith. Let's go through some of their findings, shall we? But I want to make a game out of it. I'm going to read the line that was changed, and before I read the new version, I want you to really think about who it could be offensive to. Your daughter Vanessa, judging by what she's learnt this term, has no hearing organs at all. This one's a bit obvious. It body shames creatures with no hearing organs. So it was changed to, judging by what your daughter Vanessa has learnt this term, this fact alone is more interesting than anything I have taught in the classroom. Which means something entirely different than what Dahl intended, but hey, at least no one was offended, right? When describing Matilda's father, her mother says, hardly the kind of man a wife dreams about. But this was not inclusive enough. Husbands can dream about men too. So it was changed to hardly the man of my dreams. When describing Matilda's mother, Dahl says she wore heavy makeup and had one of those unfortunate bulging figures where the flesh appears to be strapped in all around the body to prevent it from falling out. This is clearly insulting to any children who are similarly shaped and their mothers. So they cut it out entirely. While Trunchbull is interrogating Nigel, he's described as wobbling crazily on his one leg, a statement that is unforgivably offensive. The word crazy is used to disparage someone's mental health. Fortunately, inclusive minds changed it to wobbling unsteadily, because that conjures up an equally fun and silly image in children's minds, right? In chapter 14, Trunchbull fantasizes about torturing her students, saying, how splendid it would be to walk into this classroom with a gigantic spray gun in my hands and start pumping it. But that last bit was changed to start squirting them all. And somehow that's better. These editors really thought the image of Trunchbull squirting her students was preferable to her pumping a water gun. I have no words. Another line, bunch of midgets, became bunch of squirts. Okay, why are you guys so obsessed with squirting? This is supposed to be a children's book for crying out loud. Now, as you may have gathered from those lines, which I think most would agree were not traumatizing to read through at all, the sensitivity readers removed any physical descriptors, going so far as to edit and erase instances where characters turned white with fear or red in the face with embarrassment. Another focus was mental health, removing any form of the word crazy and even sane because I guess sane implies the existence of crazy. And that's not something our inclusive overlords want you to know, because then you can call them crazy. In all seriousness though, I do not think this censorship is part of any grand conspiracy to control our children's minds or intentionally turn them into a bunch of betas who can't handle hearing certain adjectives. This was clearly a case of a business responding to trends in the market. They were hit with claims that Roald Dahl was a discriminatory, hateful person and worried how that would affect sales. So they hired some help to make sure that they never heard these accusations again. What they apparently did not expect was for Roald Dahl's fan base to passionately come to his defense. A range of influential voices, from author Salman Rushdie to the UK's queen consort Camilla, expressed their distaste for these changes. What's more, Dahl's other publishing partners in the US, France, Spain, and the Netherlands all announced they would not be incorporating these changes. Meaning that if the UK residents wanted the original, they'd have to give their money to one of them. So the UK-based Puffin Books, wanting to profit off of both markets, walked their decision back and announced that, alongside their edited version, their parent company, Penguin Random House, would continue to sell the originals labeled as the classic collection, which means the next generation of youth lucky enough to pick up one of Dahl's books instead of an iPad will still get to enjoy a wacky world of cool, colorful, crazy, and cringy characters to fuel the fire of their imagination. Instead of being bored out of their minds by stories that have had all their edgiest characters sanded down into soft, harmless shapes, they'll be inspired by little Matilda defeating the big bad Trunchbull motivated by Charlie Bucket's integrity 
and emboldened by James's bravery. But as you all know, I love hearing your opinions on matters like this, even if they aren't the same as mine, so comment them down below. Do you think it's fair to retroactively edit the work of a dead author who can't consent? Why or why not? And if you're a parent, which version of Roald Dahl's stories would you want your kid to read? When you're through sharing your thoughts, make sure you sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons to get more deep dives into classic children's literature sent to your sub box, as well as mythology and folklore. I'll see you all again next week and the next with some particularly patriotic content in honor of the U.S.'s upcoming birthday. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.